Ground penetrating radar, LIDAR taken from air. Magnetometry mapped with GPS data. Photogrammetry. The use of information and communication technology in archaeology is changing the application of archaeology in the field today. With these changes in technology in mind, we can ask the question, how do we best preserve archaeological sites and the artefacts they hold in the most culturally appropriate way possible? Archaeology historically was based on digs that uncover and expose historic structures, materials and artefacts both above ground and below. Site preservation management plans sought to protect sites from weathering, including rain, ice, snow, mudslides, ground movement and natural site deterioration. These plans can minimise site damage, but they cannot pre prevent it from occurring at all. And there are some things that you just can't plan for because they simply are not expected. ISIS has started bulldozing the Asian city of Nimru. Militants used military vehicles to destroy at least part of the archaeological site. The group's destruction of an ancient city in Iraq. This crater is all that remains of the ancient Assyrian city of Nimrud. When it comes to current uses, trends and applications, the first place to look is at ground penetrating radar and LIDAR from air. It provides a far greater picture than is simply available from satellite imaging. What makes the LIDAR scan so invaluable is the method's ability to remove the noise of trees and vegetation from the data. Ground penetrating radar shoots electromagnetic pulses into the earth from airplanes and sometimes helicopters. These signals are reflected back by any underground structures, and the difference in the laser return times makes it possible to create a 3D image of the terrain. It works in the forest as well because enough laser light can penetrate through the trees so that we achieve a relatively exact surface image even in the forest. On this image, you can follow the course of the Roman lemus, the border between the Roman Empire and non-occupied regions. This here may have been a watchtower. And here, in the forest, the remnants of a field of burial mounds. This one here could theoretically be a burial mound that was opened in the past. My guess would be sometime in the 18th century. At the time, people typically entered from the top. We call it funneling. So they dug a funnel into the mound to extract burial objects or skeletons. And what remained were these small holes at the top of the mound. These faint traces indicate that's what happened here. When it comes to getting a more detailed picture of what lies beyond the ground, that's where magnetometry really comes into its fore. In archaeology, state-of-the-art technology sometimes assumes the guise of an antiquated handcart. While archaeologists Root Boising and Roseanne Schott set up their equipment on a meadow, their colleagues nearby are preparing a device that does look more high-tech. The geomagnetic apparatus is so heavy it has to be towed by a vehicle. Both devices do the same thing, only this one is larger and can survey a wider area. The archaeologists drag the sensors across the meadow to determine what lies beneath the surface. This device is two meters wide and equipped with five sensors. You can cover two to three hectares a day with a device like this. So it's a fast way of collecting and evaluating archaeological data. Equipped with 16 sensors, their colleague's magnetometer is even more effective in gathering archaeological evidence. So we need to be careful here, because if we swap the cables, then the sensors will transmit the wrong positions. But that's why we do a final check to see that everything's working. 
so eine Prüfung, ob das alles funktioniert. The team is scouting for traces of ancient life underground without the intervention of a shovel. It's a non-invasive technique called prospection. Ich verbinde jetzt gerade I'm now hooking up the geomagnetic device to the computer. The computer has the task of recording all the measurement data and showing us where we have to prospect even when we are driving across the terrain. Den Weg zu zeigen, wo wir zu prospektieren haben. The 16 sensor device is used to take geomagnetic measurements of the ground. The use of photogrammetry allows for the 3D recreation of artifacts that are located on archaeological sites. It does this by using multiple still photographs that are stitched together to make a high resolution recreation of an object. This same technology can be used in the same way for the formation of 3D tours and other forms of virtual reality. Back in the safety of their workstation at Monash University, Louise and geologist Steve Micklethwaite are creating a 3D model from drone photos. But it looks like that's the burial. It looks like you can just see the top of the skull. Allowing them to explore sites remotely and securely. We upload a whole bunch of photographs into the software and then the software will start to identify pixels that are of a particular object that it can see in several photographs at once. So you end up generating a 3D point cloud of pixels floating in space. If I zoom right in, you can see each individual pixel. There's also little blue squares, and those blue squares represent the position that the drone was at when it was taking photographs. And then I'm going to show you the model once it's been densified. This image now, you're looking at the 3D model as a textured wireframe. It's very photorealistic. This use of photogrammetry provides learning opportunities for both archaeologists and non-archaeologists alike. It was a turn of good fortune in the midst of terrible misfortune. The temple was badly damaged in the war, but at least its memory has been digitally preserved. The scan data is so precise, the inscriptions are even more legible in virtual reality than they were in real life. When I learned to dig, I had a piece of paper and a pencil. That was all. Today we can use a scanner that is much more accurate than any reproduction on a sheet of paper. Of course, that also gives rise to new fields of inquiry. At Site 52 it's mostly canopied with tree cover, so the drone in its normal sense wouldn't be very useful. And that's where this understated looking prototype holds extraordinary promise. Calvin and, and his professor, Huam Chung, have designed this drone to be able to fly autonomously and not collide into the walls. And it's going to be collecting data from the tunnel walls. You'll see the objects coming up in real time on the computer screen. So it's effectively building up the 3D image of this tunnel as it goes. We're wanting to take drones a step forward. We want to not only fly them to collect pretty images, but we also want to be able to get them flying without any human being piloting them, maybe getting lots of them flying at once, and critically, get them collecting the data and analyzing the data as they go. It's just unbelievable, the destruction, you know, how they're targeting pre-Islamic uh, cultural heritage. It is part of our human past, and that, that element, that part of our past, is irretrievably lost. 
we can do the best that we can to teach our own students uh, about this past, but these students would never be able to visit that palace. That was another reason for choosing this particular model to introduce the students. Just okay. Slide through like that. The VR is the next best thing. The course is an introduction to ancient Near Eastern culture. When we get to the Assyrian kings, now we can talk about one of their great cultural expressions, which are these monumental palaces. They entered a throne room in a palace, and the palace was called the Northwest Palace, and it was built by an Assyrian ruler called Aswarnasirpal. So these were meant to be a projection of the might of the empire and the might of the king. They're like mountains, they're so big. You, and you can't comprehend that human beings created this. So with the way that we're taught with images and little objects, you never understand, you know, what's the scale of these things? What does it feel like to be in the, in the palace? What's the grandeur of such a palace? Then you're thinking, what, wouldn't it be ideal if there was a way that they could immerse them in that um, particular environment, we decided maybe we can start using VR as a possible uh, technology to help build that. Like that? Yeah, exactly. Whoa, oh my god. <laughs> Whoa, wait, what? <laughs> I've, ne I've never done so that. So virtual reality is not really established as a, a viable instructional tool yet. Uh, you know, we're in unknown territory. Whoa, weird. Ah, that's so crazy. It is not about the technology. It is uh, all about how we use the technology to impact education and just help it make a better experience. The creatures that guard and protect major doorways are often depicted in Assyrian art as having bulls or lions' bodies, wings... It was a lot more effective as a teaching tool than I had expected. There's a reconstruction of partial of, of one of these rooms at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I take students there as well. But it's nothing like the dizzying sensation of stepping into the throne room in this virtual reality. It was really amazing to, to go into to VR and get that sense of space. You have these goosebumps going and you have the chills because the lighting, the sounds and everything is absolutely like you are in that in Paris and environment. The ceiling is so high you have to turn your head to look up at it. It's a physical sensation of stepping into a really large space that is so large, it's disorienting. The highest ceilings, like I don't understand how you paint that high if you're living in like, I don't even know, 4,000 BC. There's no substitute for the real thing. But what the VR does in combination with the real art is set it into its architectural context in a way that is very difficult for, for anyone to do with slides. There are some constants and some almost uh, incomprehensible differences, but understanding the human past and objects that were created in the past, I think it, it tells us something about what it, what it, you know, the human condition, what it is to be a human. With all of these fantastic advancements in archaeology as a result of the use of information and communication technology, we are still a long way off having a unified direction for the progression of technology in this area. A working group has come together and created several frameworks which will support a unified direction for archaeology in its use of ICT in the future. This has been documented in what is known now as the London Charter. The future of archaeology in hand with information and communication technology looks bright. However, as we progress into the future, there are several areas of dispute which will need to be created into standard practice as archaeologists, academics and technologically skilled staff come together to create those standards of practice. One such academic dispute which is common is in regard to how to best recreate sites where only partial data exists. The lack of a unified methodology on how to best recreate sites leads to the use of a variety of tools and packages such as photogrammetry at a data collection stage, digitisation of hand drawings 
and 3D extrapolation of measurements using software packages which are commercial 3D packages that are not designed specifically for such tasks. Without a unified methodology, this means that long-term preservation and addition of new data to the archaeological record could become compromised, as many types of software will be needed in order to open older file types in the future. Another concern is the matter of intellectual property, the question of who owns the past. It becomes more complex now with the use of digital and virtual archaeology in conjunction with traditional archaeology. Traditionally, it was deemed that those who were responsible for the study being undertaken, such as funding body, a company or a government, were the owners of any intellectual property that came from said study, including toward returning agency to the communities in which the studies are or were undertaken. For example, in the return of Indigenous Australian artefacts to descendants. The impacts upon digital and virtual archaeology as well as gaining permissions to store, use and distribute information may now lie with many more people than was originally envisioned when the study was undertaken in its original form. A third consideration is the perceived lack of privacy of data that is stored or broadcast in publicly accessible databases or in easily accessed virtual tours and can potentially cause cultural offence to some people groups. For example, is it appropriate on a virtual tour of Ayers Rock to include sacred sites which are secret men's or women's business areas? Therefore, there needs to be some decisions made about how appropriate permissions must be obtained in order to distribute the data so as not to cause offence while still allowing for an educative application of the data itself. Digital archaeology is the future of historical research, but even today we can't do everything on a computer. We're standing here in the landscape and we feel what's unique about it. We see the Hill of Tara. We see the topography. We get a holistic sense of the place. It's not possible to reproduce that in a virtual world. Technology provides us with useful tools, but the archaeologist still has to do fieldwork. With the anticipated evolution of the current London Charter into the future, and as we progress into virtual reality tours, including 4D experiences that are used to show what the building of certain areas may have looked like, along with walkthrough of areas long lost to time, there is a future of digital and virtual archaeology that makes it an exciting field to be in as the 21st century progresses.